this is not vigorous. <laughs> so half of you went, oh, shame. And the other half went, yay. It's probably more like a third went, thank God. A third went, shame. And the other third went, yeah. Something like that. No. <laughs> oh. Is that your goal? It's a guilt complex. Yeah. So I thought that was the Methodist guilt complex because I was brought up Methodist. But then my Catholic friend said, no, that's the Catholic guilt complex. So you can, we can fight about whose denomination. Um, or the, I don't know what the Muslim English guilt complex. So there's no Japanese guilt complex. There's no uh, German guilt complex. There's no, maybe there is. I don't know. Maybe we just all, huh? Fly on your side. And we're going to study the theory. This is for you, Julie. We're going to have the, stu the theory of comfort. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So here, the theory is, well, what, you know, it's a concept, right? Comfort. Um, What's comfortable for one person is not comfortable for another person. And, and it's not unusual for people to, after you really dissect what they're asking for in a, uh, when they come for a functional integration lesson, so they want to be more comfortable in life. Um, and com <sighs> will you think for yourself, I'm just going to be quiet for a minute. Think for yourself, what, what's the experience of comfort? And then you can just start yelling out things when I tell you to. But think quietly inside your own head first about, about the attributes of comfort. Comfort food, comfort furniture, comfortable environment. <clears throat> think about if I said to you get comfortable what are you sorting for you know what are the parameters that tell you whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable is it possible to be too comfortable So anybody care to share? What's, what is a feature of comf being comfortable? What's your theory, Julie? Absence of tension. Be a pardon. Soothing. Nourishing. Happiness. Safe. Breathing easily. Balanced calmness of of the mind, absence of discomfort, peace, warmth, sustainable so that you can stay there. So when Zoran and Jenny and I were talking about comfort. Zoran had a bit of a rising about it. <laughs> Dubbed you in, got him. Uh, because we can equate comfort to more with the going to sleep and zonking out, like winking out of life, as opposed to being ready to either zonk out or rev up. Right? Sorry? What was your word? Potency, yeah, that kind of thing. So it's not necessarily what Bottom Christ is talking about—that being that sort of state of 
potency is not necessarily a state of comfort. But let's say it's a state of equipoise. So I've used that word this morning. This sort of equality of poise, which for some people actually is, is a comfortable position. And I'm just going to... I just have to do a big one, otherwise I do four. If I do a big one, there's only two. Um, so you could think about equipoise as being, maybe it's comfortable. And could you then reframe comfortable to be the, that sort of state where you are comfortable to do, to go in kind of any direction, if you like. So often when we are working with people in FI, we want to start off from a position of comfort because we might be perturbing them in some way. So comfortable, a word that didn't come up is familiar. So often we are familiar with a comfortable position because we adopt it. Sometimes we have to help people how to find out how to be comfortable. So let's do a little exercise in what might or might not be comfortable. This is something that uh, we just get people to do as a little mini kind of ATM to help them go to sleep or find comfort or to be able to sit, you know, sit in a lecture theatre or whatever. So notice the position that you're in lying on your side. So I'm presuming that you are somewhat comfortable. And find a way, let's see if we can find more comfort. Find a way that your head could go forward and backward and take it as far forward as is easy. So this is flexing and as far back as is easy and go slowly through that whole trajectory and find the point, which might not be the middle of that pathway where actually it feels the most comfortable to rest. So some people are flexing the head on the neck and some people are flexing the neck on the body. If you can feel the difference. One is where the, the chin is moving relative to the throat and one is where the, the, the head is moving relative, the whole head is moving relative to the chest. So the middle is not necessarily the equipoise sort of position. The position where if I said you're neither flexed nor extended, but you know, it's like it's, let's say it's the Goldilocks position. Again, that's sort of just right. Now do it with your eyes. Lift your eyes up in the, look to, you know, as if they're gonna look up and then look down, just the eyes. And find a position, this is with your eyes shut. Find a position where they're kind of, you feel like they can rest a bit like a marble in a rut. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I mean, often we actually don't even know what position our eyes are in when we're resting. <coughs> so much for my theory of a couple of big sneezes gets rid of them. <coughs> Sorry. Now with your uppermost arm, the one that's closest to the ceiling, find a way that you could flex it forward as far as comfortable and then extend it back behind you. And find <coughs> somewhere along that trajectory that feels like it's neither one thing nor the other. So again, it's not necessarily the middle. It's where it might feel right to you just to settle like where a pendulum might settle <coughs> a pen where a pendulum might settle so a pendulum is that weight that swings from the bottom of a clock and it swings far right and far left and gradually, if you take the motor, it just gradually settles relative to gravity.
that's from the shoulder point of view. What about the elbow? So bend and straighten the elbow in its kind of full potential and find where that might feel. And that might dictate a little bit where the shoulder is, but so if you <clears throat> Just the elbow. <clears throat> and flex the wrist forward and backward. So the, the wrist of the arm that's uppermost. And find out where that feels. kind of neutral, middle, uncommitted. You could say it feels a bit like Switzerland. You know, it's neither, it's not committed politically. Mm -hmm. And the fingers flexed and extended. <clears throat> And allow them to settle somewhere within that trajectory in a position of repose. Now the underneath arm, it's kind of hard to explore the trajectory of the underneath arm from the shoulder point of view. But you could slide it a little bit up and down on the floor, couldn't you? A little bit up towards the head and down. Just to see where in all of those positions <clears throat> the upper arm likes to lie. And the elbow and the hand, again, they're, they're not as easy to manipulate when they're underneath you. You can be somewhat systematic. Whereabouts, how much bending or straightening of the elbow? Bending and straightening of the wrist and the fingers. This is harder to, harder to do in a way lying down on, on your side, but you've got a bit of an experience now of being more fl flexed in the trunk or less flexed in the trunk. You know, that middle part of you that you accessed this morning. So is your back more curved outward or is it straighter? Or is it curved back the other way? If you find a way to explore those two curves, you're back curving backwards, you're back curving forwards. Because actually in the room, some people do lie on their side with their back curved inwards and, so, and some people you know, curve it into flexion. So some people keep their back extended and some people flex it a lot. So... Again, we're exploring every, if everybody extends their back a little bit and then flexes a little bit and somehow finds out where their, their little equipoise position is, where they feel kind of neutral. It's a bit hard to slide on the floor, but you're creative.
and when the hips, so the legs, the upper legs, coming more towards the chest or away from the chest, so more flexed or less flexed. You can do one at a time, or you can do them both together. We'll try both. Remember, I got you to do this this morning because you will immediately lay down with your hips relatively flexed. Whereas in Amherst, it takes a while to get them to all flex the hip because they will lay down like they're in a line. So you've got some experience of that. And then the knees, so you could straighten and bend your knees or one knee at a time. Is it different for one leg versus the other or is it more comforting to have the two legs together for you? And the final one that we'll explore is the flexing and extending at the ankle. So have your toes pointing more down, so the forefoot pointing more down or bringing it up so that the, the, the toes are coming more towards the front of the shin. Do you remember we called that? Palm to flexion, moving in the direction of the sole versus dorsi, moving in the direction of the top of the foot. And find out where is the kind of equipoise where they feel neither one thing nor the other. <clears throat> neither plantar flexed or dorsi flexed at the ankle. And it might be the same for each foot where they finally settle in the region of Switzerland. Or they might be slightly different, might be dependent on where your knee and your hip is for that leg. Now, simply, quietly lie there. And allow your attention to sort of sweep over your whole self. A bit like a shepherd, just, you know, checking in on the flock. But it's all there, accounting for all the sheep. And does this equate to this, does this tally up with this, you know, if we think about these two very related ideas of comfort or equipoise, you've kind of found the, that mid zone, the sort of neutrality. We had, I've had this discussion with a few groups about why I didn't, we used to always use the word neutral rather than equipoise. Neutral to me means sort of nothing. It means just uncommitted or vague or something. But apparently there was a mechanic in a group that I was discussing this with and he or she, I can't remember, said neutral in a car is not uh, uncommitted. It's still a state. It's not, it's not a uh, wishy-washy. You know, it's, it's, there's a definite... Um, uh, what would you say, commitment there, commitment to being neutral. So you could think about the term as neutral. We've offered you this different term, equipoise. 
it may or may not uh, equate to comfort. However, maybe you could start moving your definition of, definition of comfort towards this state. So some people have found out a funny way to be comfortable when they're living at the extreme, which to my mind is a little bit of a maladaptive kind of comfort. And maybe contemplate this notion that in this position, you could just as easily fall asleep as if I now said slowly lengthen out, roll onto your back and come up to sitting, that you could do either direction as easily. Off you go. <coughs> or not so easy. <laughs> You're a little bit more committed to the sleep direction. Okay, go back down to the comfortable, so that equipoise position and lower your alertness the opposite direction. So if you're going to fall asleep and play around with the alertness so that you're neither fully alert alert or going to sleep alert, but you're somewhere in between so that your kind of attention, your cognitive state is sort of Switzerland neutral. How could that, how could you find a way that your nervous system could find equipoise, that you're neither upregulated or downregulated, that your nervous system could just as easily fall asleep as wake up and do maths or public speaking or something quite um, you know, arousing? And maybe you could just imagine going there in your, in your sort of mind's eye, imagine sort of leaping up in public speaking and imagine dropping to sleep. And again, do that kind of pendulum between those two states and find out what the state would be that you could, you could contemplate either with you know, relative um, equality of um, preparation, let's say. So that was Feldenkrais's definition is without untoward preparation, you could go into one state or the other. You know, without adjust, unnecessary, adjust, not unnecessary, but without excessive adjustment. Now imagine it from an emotional, so from a feeling point of view. Imagine, let's take a feeling like uh, happiness. And let's say the opposite of happiness is sadness, let's say. And could you imagine feeling sad and then imagine feeling happy and seesaw between the two? We, I'm happy, I'm sad. We, I'm happy, I'm sad. Um, and find, find a place where you can contemplate either with relative ease. And if, you've, if, if that is, makes any sense whatsoever, could you maintain that kind of state, slowly roll over and come up to sitting and then standing? And, in, and standing is not uh, you know, particularly neutral, but find a way that's where you could be somewhat neutral in standing. You're neither slumped, you're neither a soldier. Because you, could, you can do this little kind of exploration in any position. So we'll do it in standing just because that seems to be quite dramatically different. So here the little adjustments might be um, a lot more subtle. 
and there might be let's let's try so you could have we'll pick two you can, you can, the way you play this game is you just pick anything and you you pick uh, the dichotomy around it so let's say the way you've got your weight on your feet you've got your weight more on the front of your feet or the back of your feet so more towards the toes and more towards the heels and sway so that your weight goes more towards the back and then more towards the front keep swaying forwards and backwards but gradually gradually the sway gets less and less and less until you kind of settle somewhere it might not be the middle like the, the middle in reality but what feels like the equipoise state between forwards and backwards for you And it might not be what's familiar, but it might be. Remember, we talked about that being the familiar might be conflated with the comfortable. Now notice your knees, are they, are they bent or are they straight? So bend them more and then straighten them completely and go between those two dichotomies until you find a place that feels equitable. And then tally that up with where the weight is on the feet. You don't lose that. You could do another one. Arch your back and flatten your back a few times. So tip your pelvis forwards and back. So make your back more arched or less arched. And keep finding the in-between place, the Goldilocks place. the shoulders you could drop your shoulders forwards and brace them back and again find the goldilocks place so this idea of equipoise poised equitably and settle somewhere with your shoulders and make sure that that sort of still tallies with the, the back being neither arched nor flattened, the knees being neither bent nor straight, the weight being neither forward or backward. And you could find a position for the head. You could drop it forwards a la Zoran's exercise and then take it back. The same with the eyes. The eyes could be looking up towards the top of your sockets and down to the bottom of the sockets. Find a place going up and down, up and down, and gradually the trajectory gets shorter and shorter till you settle. And you open your you can open your eyes and find out where that is. And again, from your nervous system point of view, or from an action point of view even, let's say let's make it a little bit more operational, that you could launch off into a jog or you know, a game of squash or roll down onto the floor to have a sleep. You could contemplate in your intention either of those two activities with relative ease, without too much preparation, too much adjustment. 
you know, you wouldn't have to go and put a new set of clothes on or anything. You get a different, well, maybe to play squash. You might need a different mindset. Could you imagine going with equal felicity? Who is this chick called Felicity anyway? Some old thing. It's my Jane Austen period, pre-Star Trek. And you could pick another emotion dichotomy, like maybe, uh, hmm, chilled out or anxious. Like chilled out to the point of being comatose versus high anxiety. Just take yourself gently towards either of those poles and find somewhere where you're neither, you know, so chilled out that someone wants to shake you because you just don't care. So maybe it's more like over-caring versus under-caring. Something like that. How is it in standing versus lying? So a lot of people standing is not comfortable. For, for a lot of people, standing is not comfortable. So often we are giving lessons to help people find some comfort or lose their discomfort in standing as a posture or sitting. Sitting is a big one as well. So you could do exactly this, this same sort of thing in sitting. And now walk. And imagine that in, from this state of walking, you could just as quickly go into a flat out run as stop and sleep on the floor. Could you imagine doing either of those things? Or are you a little bit more drawn to one than the other? How would you have to walk to, have, to find the middle? This is getting a little bit tricksy now, isn't it? What would be the internal sense So we'll continue to play a lot with this sort of this idea of finding an, an alternative to the, to a, any dichotomy that you care to choose. There's a couple of classic ATMs for this that are coming up in future segments. Um, go to your mat. Let's do a little mini eye ATM just to get that happening. This one's going to wake you up. Speaking of being upregulated, whoa. 